Welcome to the All About Alts podcast, where we explore the world of alternative investing to help you find financial independence. Join our host, New View Trust's president, Jason DeBono, as he covers a variety of topics with different guest speakers to discuss tax and alternative investing strategies. It is never too late to start taking control of your financial future, and we are so excited for you to be joining us for this opportunity to hear from some of the best in the business. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the All About Alts podcast. I am Jason DeBono, your host. Excited to be here with you today. We got a pretty fun topic that actually came in uh, from one of our listeners. And when I read it, I thought, well, I don't know if this is a topic for a podcast, right? This is almost like an email. But as I started thinking a little bit more about it and and kind of thought about what the question may have been uh, looking for contextually, I realized, I think there's some meat here. And so we're going to have some fun today talking about liquidity versus illiquidity. Now, a lot of people are probably thinking, well, what what do you mean liquidity versus illiquidity and and why do I care? Um, And I I, want to kind of hopefully maybe just shed a little bit of light on what the difference between a liquid and illiquid investment means. What does that illiquidity actually mean? What are time horizons? How do we think about that? And then how do we look at an investment strategy that maybe includes uh, liquid and illiquid investments because a lot of people uh, may not know that that a lot of asset classes have some sort of lockup or tie up uh, from a time horizon and so it's something that you want to be really aware of not because it's bad but maybe understand the why and see if it fits in to your investment strategy so let's start with what do you, what does liquidity mean well liquidity means it can be sold on the open market anytime Right. So when we think of liquid investments, certainly cash, right? Obviously, that's the most liquid. It's cash. It's it's available and ready for use. But when we make investments, right, we look at liquidity is really more like a public equity. Right. So if you think about what that means, if I go buy shares of Microsoft, it's a liquid investment. It means that I can liquidate it at any time. Now, I'm subject to market gains or losses if I do sell it. So we've gone from cash, which is truly liquid, right? Liquid at any time. And I don't have a loss to sell money market cash. But if I buy a stock, I have gain opportunity and loss opportunity between those points of liquidity. So when we think about public equities, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, all of these investments are purely liquid. It's why there's so many investments into those markets. It's why it's an easy thing for you to put your money into and pull your money out. So when we think about putting money into investments like that, it's certainly a great place for short or long-term money. So when we say short or long-term money, uh, retirement money is already earmarked for the long-term. So if I buy an investment that has a longer time horizon, that may not be as big of a deal. But if I take money that's sitting in my savings account and I want to put it into an investment, if I put that into, let's say, shares of Microsoft, if I ever need that money, right, regardless of what the reason's for, I can go liquidate. If I put it into something that has a time horizon, I may not have that liquidity available to me. But remember, anytime you make an investment into a liquid investment or something that can be liquidated quickly, you have to be very mindful that your liquidity timing may not line up with market conditions. So there's no guarantee that if you put a thousand bucks into Microsoft that you'll get a thousand bucks out you will get your market rate for the security when you liquidate it at that time. So just something, I know that seems simplistic maybe to many of you, uh, some of our regular listeners, but uh, for those that don't understand that liquidity uh, is an event, it's an act, it's selling uh, of something, and you can only sell something when there's an open market to sell it. The less of an open market there is to sell it, the longer the time horizon is or the more discounted it will be to sell. And so we'll kind of walk through that uh, here in just a bit. So when we kind of take stock bonds and mutual funds, right, and we just kind of push them to the side, those are the most common, you know, public equities, they're the most common uh, assets that have, you know, genuine liquidity for the most part at any time. But we're going to look at alternatives. Now, alternatives have liquidity events in a lot of different ways. And this is something that my first bit of guidance to you is, what is your liquidity need and want? So if you kind of look at your your money, typically you have money that's yours in your personal name. It's used to pay your bills, right? You should have savings, right? That would be your second bucket of money. That's money that you've earmarked that you don't anticipate spending. 
Uh, this may be money that you're saving for something specifically, or you're simply saving just to, to have a cushion, right? I think a lot of uh, advisors uh, and, and wealth strategists would suggest that you have six months of pay uh, in some sort of account so that you have money in the event of an emergency. And then you have maybe what we'll call longer term money, which is still money that's in your name. It's still money that you can use and do what you want with it. But it's money that you're saying, hey, like, I don't, I've got my six month emergency fund. This is money that I really want to start putting away and investing. And the reason why you want to get money into that long term is it opens up this window of investment strategies. So, for example, you probably wouldn't want to go buy a house with your three months of emergency savings, not because the house may not be a good investment, but because houses can't be liquidated quickly. So if this is emergency savings money, it has to be readily available for you. So you want to be careful, right? Kind of taking money that you're saving and not really thinking about how long you're saving it for. Now, let's assume you've got your three to six months of emergency savings. You feel comfortable with your income, your expenses, you're budgeting very well. Now you can start putting that money into what I would call that kind of long-term bucket that says, hey, I want to put this in the best opportunity for me. And if that is real estate and it is a longer term hold, that's OK for me because that's really money that I don't need or, or have to touch, hopefully, anytime soon. So be thinking about how you kind of park money. The fourth bucket and one that I think is critical is your retirement savings bucket. Now, certainly that's earmarked for the long term, right? Depending on your age, you're likely going to have a much higher time horizon on the need for that money. And part of the deal of putting it away for the long term is the tax advantages that come with that. So now you've got this bucket of money that's earmarked for the long, the truly the long term, but Uncle Sam is going to give you tax incentives to put that money to work, right? So you want to be thinking about those different sources of funds. So when we start thinking about investments, we need to start looking at first, what type of money am I willing and needing to invest? The shorter duration that you have, the more attractive public equities or cash true liquid investments become. Because it's really the only way to ensure that if you put it in today and need to take it out tomorrow, that you're going to have that access obviously subject to market conditions, but at least you know it's never uh, under lock and key. As you move further down the, the buckets of money, you start thinking longer term. So when we think about long-term investment strategies, there's a lot of different ways that you can lock money up. And the beauty of alternative assets is that there's so many different alternative asset classes that are available. So for example, crypto is an alternative asset right? Because it's it's not considered a traditional investment. Now, what's nice about crypto, not from an investment standpoint, that's your decision to decide. But just from a liquidity standpoint is there are exchanges now and most, most firms have exchanges where you can liquidate your crypto immediately. The drawback to crypto is that it's generally highly volatile. So that means if you put your three month savings into crypto, right? In, in two months, if you need to go pull some out, it could be worth way more or it could be worth way less. So you have to be very careful, right? Buying alternatives or buying investments that are too short a duration because some of these alternative asset classes may need more time or may need better timing for them to make more sense. So if we keep looking past crypto, another kind of shorter term asset class that we see is private notes. What's nice about private notes is typically they can have a maturity and a duration. So we have clients that write loans for 90 days. They do short-term loans. Um, we, do, we have clients that do six months. Very common to see clients do one year. But while these have some time horizon, they usually have a start date and an end date, much like a CD. But typically, a promissory note is going to pay a higher rate, maybe come with more risk than a CD. But what you're buying is you're buying the ability to drive your rate of return higher. So if you look at an average note and you were to look at the duration, you can now match that duration up to the bucket of money and start to see if it makes sense. So if you've got money sitting in, in a shorter term vehicle and you really don't think you'll need it for six months, but, but are a little bit too nervous to invest it beyond that, you may be able to find a six month note where you can get a rate of return that you can can that is fixed, right, predetermined, that has a maturity. Obviously, you need to make sure that the borrower is paying you back and, and that you've got good collateral. But it's one of the few asset classes that you can have in much different time horizons based on your palette, 
Um, you could do a one-year note, a two-year note, a three-year note, a five-year, a 10-year, a 20-year, a 30-year. So you have this luxury of lining up the timeline to your investment strategy. And what's nice for, for investments like that is that you can split money up between multiple notes. You can write notes at different durations. Uh, so you have a lot more flexibility uh, in that particular asset class. If we keep looking kind of down that road, the third way, you know, that that outside of of kind of that crypto or, or promissory note is real estate. Now, real estate is an interesting investment from a time horizon standpoint, and from a liquidity standpoint. In some instances, you could make a case that technically it can be liquidated easily, right? There are an entire exchange of real estate um, on the market. You can put it up for sale. Someone can buy it and you can make that liquidity event happen pretty quickly. Now, it's technically not a liquid investment because it's not an immediate liquidation like a public equity. But real estate's interesting because it's willing buyer, willing seller. So much like, like buying a stock, you're going to be subject to market conditions. So you want to really think about what your time horizon looks like as it relates to that real estate. Because if you're planning to buy a piece of property and selling it in six months, you've got to really be sure that you're going to manage that, right? How are you going to do that? Are you buying it right? You know, what do you think the market's going to look like in six months? Are you are there going to be willing buyers at that point? How long does it take to close? Is there an inspection period? You've got a lot of things to consider. So when we look at real estate, real estate is another one of those that has really kind of a very short, right, if you will, or long duration, depending on your desire. But typically selling it in the short run may be harder. You may have to lower the price. So again, you know, we're talking about creating liquidity, not about whether you're going to maximize the investment value. Um, but one thing to caution people of is that we've seen this a lot is that people buy real estate with short-term intentions, and they don't have a plan B if they have to hold it longer. So that's something that you really need to be thinking about is in the event that you can't sell it or that you don't want to discount the price anymore, or whatever it may be, right? Is that money stuff that you need in three to six months? If so, you probably shouldn't be buying direct ownership real estate with that without a very good exit strategy. Moving down this kind of investment train, into different options and opportunities that we see our clients invest into. And this is a very broad one, but that is investing into private equity. Now, private equity can be structured in a lot of different ways. And private equity could actually be real estate. It could be oil and gas. It can be, you know, debt funds. There's a lot of different ways. It could be businesses. Um, but a lot of times private equity sliced up into a variety of terms. Now, we, we've we done a show previous in season two where we talked about the different types of asset classes. We talked about the difference between a syndication and we talked about what, um, you know, an LLC and LP look like and how those work and what meet it takes uh, to invest if it requires you to be an accredited investor. So go back and listen to that if you haven't heard that one yet. Um, but if we're going to talk about private equity, private equity has a much different time horizon uh, than a lot of traditional investments and even other alternatives. Most syndication deals have a predetermined holding period that they're shooting for. So for example, um, and we'll just call it uh, a, a multifamily deal, a multifamily deal that's development is probably going to have a three to five year lockup no matter what, because from the time they buy it, get the property, get the property developed, site plans approved and build the property, there really can't be an exit that's meaningful for investors for three to five years. Now, that doesn't mean it's a guarantee it'll be out in three to five years. Uh, it could be a, tangled up in getting any sort of entitlements. It can be tangled up in getting you know permits and building materials and all these things that we've seen over the last few years, they're all real. Uh, and so when you're looking at these private equity, especially syndication deals that are real estate backed, you got to really understand what this investment is before you go putting your money into it. Because if you put money that you may need in a couple of years thinking that, yeah, it'll be in and out, um, you may be in a very tough position if six months or if two years, three years goes by and that deal still hasn't materialized. Maybe the liquidity event is being pushed out. And in today's marketplace, and we're currently in 24, you know, you've got interest rates um, that are above, well above what people expected. Um, a lot of liquidity events for private equity, especially real estate, is uh, refinance. And so if refinance is not attractive, maybe they may wait another year or two until rates get more attractive to, to approach a refinance. So you've got a lot of variables at play. 
for other types of real estate deals inside of private equity, uh, it may be something that can offer some liquidity. So some cash flowing syndications may offer liquidity every 12 months. Uh, I think BlackRock, um, you know, which is a, a massive uh, offer of private equity real estate, um, they have a monthly redemption period, which means you can go ask for your money back um, every month. Now, they only have a certain amount that they'll withdraw. Uh, and so you may have to wait in line. And there was a period in the last, I think now they've met all their redemptions for the last few months. But uh, some of these projects, you know, their goal was to have liquidity and they have a cap and you kind of think they'll never hit it. Um, but again, market conditions can cause different things to happen. So if you were waiting on that money and you were planning to redeem this month and, and yours didn't get redeemed, obviously, you know, that can create some pickles for you. So think about liquidity specifically as it relates to the investment strategy you're looking for. Some syndications uh, offer quarterly liquidity, annual liquidity, or no liquidity, right? So there's uh, a few different ways to get there. So if you're, if you're investigating or doing due diligence on any sort of private investment, make sure that you're asking yourself, what's my exit, right? Do you control the exit? Like if you own a piece of real estate directly, you have much more control because you can dictate when it goes on the market, you can dictate the price if you need to sell it you know, quickly. If you're in a syndicate, you're relying on the issuer to control all of those variables and you're not the only investor. So while you may need your money out, there may be 500 investors next to you that don't. So as a result, there may not be value in selling that asset or creating a liquidity event just so that you can get redeemed when there may be 99 other investors that don't want to go that route. So you want to make sure that you're lining up liquidity. So when we talk about retirement accounts, the reason that illiquid assets fit so well in a retirement account is as a general rule, you're not touching those till at least 59 and a half. So for most investors with their IRA, the reason that they're very attracted to private equity, to alternatives, is because they know that not only can they hopefully drive higher returns, which is always the first goal, they can also be far more flexible than they can with their personal money. Because in the event of a liquidity event taking five years instead of three, it's just two years closer to my retirement age if the return is still good. Whereas in my personal bucket of money, I may be concerned the difference between three years and five years of getting my money back, man, that could be catastrophic or it could cause me additional uh, challenges financially that I've got to work through and kind of figure out. So we really, really encourage people when they're looking at alternatives to take a hard look at their IRAs. You know, is there a benefit to having those illiquid investments inside a retirement account? The second thing that we really like to encourage people is if you own assets in your IRA today that are illiquid, make sure you're talking to your beneficiaries and your heirs about what that means. We see this a lot. Um, you know, one thing is certain, right? We're all going to pass and leave this earth. And when we do, do the people that are inheriting our assets know and understand what that means to them? So, you know, if, if you know, let's say my father were to pass away and pass me his IRA um, and it was all sitting in stocks and bonds, that's a pretty easy and straightforward thing for me to manage, right? I can liquidate it if I want to take the money out. No big deal. No harm, no foul, other than whether or not the market, uh, you know, conditions are good or bad. But if I inherit that same account and there's three private equity deals that, that don't mature, don't have any sort of expectation of liquidity for three to five years, I may be like, what the heck? And when you have illiquid investments that have a time horizon and you try to sell them prematurely, a, there is no secondary market as a general rule. And B, if you find a willing buyer, they're likely going to want a severe discount. And they want that discount because they're buying illiquidity, right? And so when you sell illiquidity, you sell it at a discount, not a premium. So when you think about your investment strategy, right, where are you saving your money? Are you saving enough into enough of the right places? When the money is there, how are you investing it, right? Are you thinking through the time horizon of that money and what bucket and need that money has and how long you intend to keep it in an invested state versus using it for expenses or other things? You know, that's a very important consideration. And then lastly, right, what asset classes become available if you're willing to enter into that illiquid investment state, which is can you now buy different assets that maybe you weren't even considering or weren't available to you today? And when you're in those discussions, there's a natural benefit and value 
for your IRA to participate, especially in those longer term deals. So when we go back to and look at, at syndication deals and we look at, you know, whether they're real estate backed or oil and gas or whatever that may be, um, it's important that you read the PPM, which is the private placement memorandum, and get a clear understanding of what the expectations are for that deal. And if there's a three to five years, ask yourself, you know, hold is what they're anticipating. Ask yourself, what would happen if this went to seven? And if that question the result of that question is no big deal, then probably okay, right? But if the question is, oh man, that would cause me a real issue, junior's going to college in five years, I need this money to pay for it or whatever it may be, then we may wanna step back and look and say, hey, maybe that asset class isn't for me. Maybe I need to find a different strategy, still maybe in the real estate market, but I need to find something where I've got a little more deliberate hands-on or I've got a little bit more deliberate control. The last thing that you want to do is end up with an illiquid asset and having to force a liquidity event, right? Because whether you own a piece of real estate and you need money immediately, right? You typically means you've got to drop the price significantly. If you've got a loan and you're trying to sell it before it's it's up, chances are someone's going to buy it at a discount. If you've invested into a private equity deal that has, you know, uh, still has years on it and you're trying to liquidate it, it's going to be really hard to find a buyer. And if and when you do, right? There's going to be a discount attached to that. And we don't want to see any of those things happen. So from a liquidity standpoint, make sure that you're matching up your investments against liquidity. The other big piece where liquidity comes in is required mandatory distributions. Now, I think the age is up to 74, 75. Don't quote me. It used to be 70 and a half and the SECURE Act has been moving that. But there's a point where unless you have a Roth, you're going to have to start taking money out. Now, we've seen this in the past where clients will invest the money into illiquid investments, which is OK, but they'll ignore the fact that they've got to start taking money at a certain age and they won't have the money to meet their RMD or required mandatory distribution. And so when doing that, they've just violated that kind of liquidity test because they've made an investment thinking they don't have a time horizon when in reality they do. So make sure you're kind of asking yourself, depending on your age, do I have a required liquidity amount? Am I required to withdraw from my retirement account uh, You know, this coming year? If so, I probably ought to have some cash or liquidity or assets I can liquidate inside that plan, right? What we don't want to do is we don't want to be stuck. The other thing that, that we've seen and market conditions are certainly play a big impact. And we saw this in 2007 as we entered into the Great Recession. There was a lot of deals that were at their fifth and sixth year and a lot of, of People approaching RMD age thought, well, these will all liquidate and I'll be just fine. Well, when the market and the Great Recession took over and real estate slowed down and started to lose value, there was a lot of these deals that they couldn't sell or if they did, they would take losses. And so they decided not to. Well, as an investor, if your money is in there and you're required to take it out, it's not the, the issuer of that investments problem. You've got to abide by the rules of the PPM. And so if there's no way for you to get liquidity, there's no event that would allow that, then you may see yourself in, a, in an issue where you're over retire, the required minimum distribution age, and you're now actually in a position where you cannot take your RMD. And those can be very, very, very expensive penalties should you not meet that minimum distribution. The last thing I want to talk about liquidity is opportunity cost. Right? Now, when I say opportunity cost, it means what does that actually cost you to be a liquid? So we know what the benefits are, right? Hopefully the benefits are buying asset classes that can generate higher than average returns, right? That lock the money up. All of that is fine. But there's also an opportunity cost, right? You're making an investment that may have three, five, seven years on it. Um, what's the opportunity that may present itself in that same time horizon? Now, you can't invest with this notion that there will always be something better because there may be, but if you wait too long, right, you may miss out on a lot of really good opportunity for great opportunity, but good opportunity for longer may, or may be better than great opportunity for shorter. But if you're looking at your investment strategy and you're saying, hey, I can go buy this investment for X amount of years, ask yourself, what may come up in the meantime that I would want to use this money for? Is there an opportunity cost to these funds where once I've invested them, I can't go get them back till this deal's done? And if the, this deal takes three to five years, then I've got to wait three to five years. 
And so what could come up in the meantime? And so good investment strategy is about creating liquidity all the time, making sure that you've got assets that you can liquidate when you need and assets that you don't need to liquidate, uh, maybe never. Uh, so opportunity cost is one that I think is often overlooked, uh, much like liquidity. People kind of look and say, is the deal good? You know, it makes X percent. I really want to do it. And what they fail to ask is, what is the time horizon? How long do I have to hold this? Can I ever get my money out of it? If so, when? And then lastly, if I hold it that long, did I miss out on some opportunity in doing so? And so you just want to be thinking through these things because the difference between buying public equities versus buying alternatives is all about making it a strategy that makes sense for you. So how old are you? How many years do you have before you, you know, need your retirement dollars? How many times can you invest that money over that, that period? How long you know, is the time horizon on these investments? What's the opportunity cost that, that is going to present itself? And then what is the opportunity? Can I make more money owning a real estate private equity deal, which is you know, may have a five to seven shelf, year shelf life, but may generate me more return than if I took the same dollars and just bought real estate myself, right? Yeah, I got a little more control. I've got a little more liquidity, right? I can quickly sell it if I really need to, but which one's going to yield me more money? The other kind of thing to think about is what's the discount on being too short term, right? So you keep all your money liquid uh, and that doesn't always pay off either, right? It feels good today where, you know, interest rates that we're seeing in, in liquid money market type accounts are, you know, 5%. So that feels great, but you can't assume that if I hold this for five years, I'll get 5% for five years and I can compare that to a five-year hold. That's not how it works. You may at the, in the fifth year only be getting 2% or 1% depending on what happens to interest rates. So you have to make sure you're making some pretty fair comparisons when it comes to understanding the, the cost of time, which the, the opportunity cost of being illiquid, the opportunity cost of buying long-term investments, as well as the opportunity, right? What can I gain out of this? If I buy an illiquid investment, what's the benefit? Am I going to make more money? Uh, will it yield me a better return? Is it, you know, does it take the pressure of investing off? There's a lot of things that go into that uh, that should certainly be strongly considered. So let's recap, right? We talked about liquidity versus illiquidity, right? Liquidity being assets that are read have a readily available market. And certainly the public equities fall into that, right? We talked about liquidity, no matter what, is an event. And when you create liquidity, you're subject to the market conditions at the time of liquidity. So with the exception of a money market um, there, and just general cash accounts or savings accounts, there's not a whole lot that generates return for you, right? That you can liquidate that automatically is going to be worth more. A lot of that liquidity can come at a cost and it comes at market conditions. And so if you're buying public equities, you're going to only, you can sell them quickly, but you're, they're only going to be worth what? They're worth at that snapshot in time when you make that sell decision. Going back to illiquid assets, you can buy direct assets in the real estate side and the private note side in the crypto space, if you will. Um, and all of those have different liquidity streams. And depending on the type of property that you buy, the type of loan you issue, how long the duration is, all of those have different time horizons as well. So what I love about individual assets in an IRA is that you can line up your liquidity or illiquidity um, pretty simply. And you can do that from asset to asset. It's not a universal. If you buy an alt, you got to hold it five years. If you don't, you're good. It just says if you buy an alt, there could be quick liquidity and there could be very slow liquidity. And it's up to you to make sure that you understand both the timing of the liquidity as well as how that relates to the need of the liquidity, which is a very personal decision. When we talk about packaged up investments in the alternative space, like private equity, private real estate, uh, debt funds, uh, anything along those lines, the beauty, right, from a liquidity standpoint uh, is that you typically know what the time horizon is when you go into the deal. Generally, right, you're going to know if there's a liquidity event that's, that is able to happen, like a quarterly or monthly redemption, or if you've got to wait until the investment is, is finished or has gone through full cycle. Um, and then if you buy some of these, you know, private deals, um, on the real estate side or private deals on the debt side or whatever that fund may be, um, you can cherry pick that time horizon to line up with the accounts that you hold. And going back to the very beginning, you've got short-term money, right? Money that you used to pay your bills every day. 
You've got midterm money, right? Money that you put away, probably more your emergency savings. You're hoping you keep it for longer, but you never know if you're going to need to touch it. And then you got your long-term savings, which is money that you've truly earmarked and opened the door to all of the investment strategies and philosophies uh, that are available to you. And then that fourth bucket is your retirement money, right? By far the bucket that has the longest amount of time horizon on it, because as a general rule, you can't even touch it till you're 59 and a half, not required to touch it until your mid 70s. So you've got a lot of time, hopefully, between those two points where you can take advantage of the illiquid strategies, right? Assuming that they serve you and your investment thesis better. But you can do that without care and concern about what happens if I need that money in three years, because you're really using the money that's the farthest away from your day to day or personal need. So, I hope, uh, you know, today was a, a kind of a precursor and, and gave you a little bit of understanding of liquidity. Um, you know, today was not necessarily designed to give you uh, and make you an expert on plan types or anything along those lines. But it was just to simply provide you a little bit of education uh, on the different asset classes and how to think of them a little bit differently. So I would encourage you as you're out making investments or looking at investments or considering or strategizing or building your thesis, all of those things that make sure that pretty high on that list should be time horizon. Right. And make sure that the time horizon of those asset classes you're investing in truly does line up with where you are and where you want to be. Because if you if you have misalignment between your time horizon and the investment itself, likely that's not going to end well. Right. Somehow, some way, probably not going to end well. But if you've got full alignment between your investment strategy and your time horizon and you're buying short term investments with your short term money, mid term investments with mid term and long term with long term, then you're going to dial yourself in for a really successful uh, investment road ahead. We appreciate you guys taking uh, taking the time and staying loyal listeners uh, of the All About Alts podcast. We certainly hope to see you guys all at the AltsCon event uh, coming up in mid-October. You can visit altscon.com uh, to get more information on that event. We've got a lot of great uh, people joining us to provide continuing education as well as some uh, a full marketplace of people that have different uh, you know, strategies and ideas that, uh, that you can evaluate. Uh, and then as always, um, you know, hit the like, share, subscribe button, keep this community growing as we continue to grow our, our, our entire audience base of people that are looking to just figure out how to get in the market, get out invested, but most importantly, take advantage of all that alternative investments have to offer until next week, everybody happy investing. Take care. Thank you so much for listening. We hope the information within this podcast has given you the tools that you need to find your way to financial independence. We would love to partner with you on this journey. Text ALTS, that's A-L-T-S, to 407-708-1853 to learn more about how to get started today. Don't forget to follow us to make sure you don't miss a second of content, and we'll see you next week.